I'm Owen Biglen. This is the Inside Edge video blog. Okay, I want to share with you guys an article that I was reading on the Wall Street Journal. And I've read so many over the years. And I've also blogged about this so many times over the years as well. And that's the difference between good debt and bad debt. Or as this Wall Street Journal and many others I've read, it's kind of the difference between how wealthy or rich people think and how poor and struggling people think towards debt because there's good debt and bad debt. You can't lump it all into one bundle here. They're night and day. And I'm also gonna brush on leverage. You know, the power of leverage and how really that is the greatest wealth creator. It's very difficult, be very difficult. I would have nowhere near the net worth I've got now if I wasn't able to use some leverage via Con uh, conventional mortgages on residential properties in Vancouver. That's the easiest access people have to l using leverage. And it's not easy. Contrary to what some people will tell you that anyone can go down to a bank and borrow a million dollars to buy a home. That's not the case, especially in Vancouver here. In Vancouver, where most homes are over a million dollars or close to, uh, or if you want to invest in real estate, you've got to take out a, what we call a conventional mortgage, 20% or more down. You can't use high ratio. I've talked about many times before, high ratio is very difficult. You can still do it in places like New Westminster or Burnaby or Richmond, buying a small one bedroom condo maybe for 500K, put down 10 or 15%. But I'm gonna to touch on a few things here. You know, I often see these things on the mainstream media, they, every, they roll these out endlessly, and they do it in the States too, about the average debt that the typical American or Canadian holds and how that's been going up. And they'll say the average Canadian owes $176,000 or three times their annual income. And this is crazy. It's terrible. They're headed for a major, major crash here, and they're going to all go broke and be in the poorhouse. Well, it depends on what that debt is made up of. And most of the time, most, it includes all their debt, including their home. And that's where most of that debt, 70, 80% of it, in some cases, 100% of a person's debt sits. And that is absolutely ridiculous. You have to back out the mortgage because that is good debt. Good debt is mortgages. That's where you are buying an appreciating asset, your home or an investment property. Uh, you are uh, borrowing at sub 2% interest rates. In some cases, some people are getting 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. I'm getting ready to renew some stuff now on some of my mortgages, investment units at around 1718. But I see that they've got variable rate mortgages five year for new clients. Some of these second and third tier lenders you know, at 1%, it's crazy. It's an appreciating asset. If it's a principal residence, it's also tax deferred. It's the principal resident exemption. It's the best and only true tax shelter we get. That is good debt, provided you don't over leverage yourself. But what I've said many times here, the Canadian lenders will not let you do that. They're gonna want 20, 25% down. You're gonna have to go through the gauntlet to get pre-approved submit your tax returns for the next two or three years. They might want your firstborn as well as collateral. Bad debt, on the other hand, which gets lumped into this, this consumer debt, they lump in consumer debt, which is credit cards. So credit cards are essentially loan sharking. You're paying anywhere from 20, 20% 25, 30%. I was did, told you guys just recently, my, my wife and I, of course, we don't have any credit card debt. I have no debt outside of mortgages, none. No car loans, no credit card debt. I've never had it. Student loans, furniture loans, because it's a ripoff. You guys should never have any consumer debt like that, ever. Doesn't make any sense saving for a house, saving for retirement, or investing your money if you have one penny in credit card debt or any type of consumer debt furniture loans, car loans, student loans, anything like that. Because you're getting loan shark rates there. As a matter of fact, you could probably go down to the local pool hall here and negotiate a better interest rate than you are on your Visa card or your MasterCard or whatever else. So that is bad debt. Car loans, furniture loans, uh, Hudson Bay credit cards, any type of credit card where you're paying more than 2% in interest 
uh, is bad debt, yet it gets lumped into it. I think they would be shocked probably if, I, if someone found out what my debt load is. It's several million dollars. And people might say, boy, you must have a hard time sleeping at night. I don't at all. Uh, a, all my debt is in the form of residential mortgages on investment properties. So I'm able to deduct all the interest. I'm using the leverage. Uh, I'm able to deduct my property taxes, my maintenance fees and repairs. It's working for me. I'm leveraging that. But, and the other thing is I'm not over leveraged because if push came to shove, which I would never do, I could, if I wanted to, write a check and clear it all off. But of course, I'm not going to do that. I want to let it ride and get, take advantage of the leverage, take advantage of the deductions on it. And it ceases me to no end how people confuse the two. You know, the, the bank or the, the, the government, federal government and the provincial level and, you know, Evan Sindal will throw him in there too. You know, they're obsessed with keeping people out of home ownership, borrowing the money, getting qualified for a mortgage, buying a asset that you need. You have to have a roof over your head. It certainly beats renting. You're going to borrow at 1.7, 1.8%. Yet the government does everything they can to keep you out of the housing market, putting more restrictions on the banks in, 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 the, to, in lending you money. More, I've lost count of how many stress tests we've had to go through, people have to go through, to keep you out of an appreciating asset that's tax sheltered at a sub 2% interest rate. Yet, do you ever hear them talk about credit cards at 30%, 25 and 30%? Canadians have billions of dollars in credit card debt at loan shark prices, but you never hear them talk about regulating that or, or you know, trying to curb credit card debt. This is why I tell everyone to own all the Canadian banks, because they're loan sharking to these people. I also own Visa, substantial holdings in Visa and MasterCard, even though they don't participate in the outlandish interest rates, the banks get all that. But they're the, they're the, the uh, toll, the toll booth or the pipeline. You get a two or three basis points on every transaction. But you have to know the difference between the two. Wealthy people, successful people look at debt on, like mortgages as a good thing. Because again, let's talk just quickly. I talked about it last month too, many times on leverage. Because boy, this is taboo for so many people. They think, you know, once you talk about leverage, you're over leveraging and you're taking on too much debt. And what if the house goes down 10%? Well, what? So what? You're not buying a home unless you can hold it through thick and thin. There's a good chance the house might go down 10%, but it's your principal residence. You're not a speculator. You're not flipping these or you're an investor long-term, not a, spec a flipper or a speculator. You've got a tenant in there paying you rent. Who cares what the underlying price of it is? As long as you can keep paying your mortgage payments, then your tenant is probably covering 80 or 90% of that for you. But this is how the difference between how wealthy people think and poor people think. Leverage, I'll give you this. I always give this simple example. You buy a $100,000 condo, you put 20% down because you're going to have to. The bank is going to want at least 20% down because they want to cover their ass. That condo over the next five years goes from 100 to 120. So it goes up 20% over the next five years, which is very likely. A lot of people would say, well, you made 20% on, on it. Not bad. You made 100%. You just doubled your money because you've only got 20,000 of your own money in there. You're using the bank's money at the other 80, for the other 80%. That's what leverage will do for you. I'll give you another example here. My last investment unit, which go back into my blog four and a half, five years ago, I did a two part blog because I put my money where my mouth is and gave you guys the inside and what I paid for my last pre-sale in Mount Pleasant, Olympic Village. I paid 368,000 for the unit. That unit now is probably pushing close to 600. I put 20% down on that. So I had what, off the top of my head, $60,000 down, I'm up 180, 200K. I've had a 300% return on that. Pretty good. Now, am I tempted to sell that home and cash in? Absolutely not. As I've often said, I've only played two innings of baseball. 
I've got a good tenant in there. I'm collecting $2,100 a month in rent. The tenant's paying everything for me, including a fair bit of my principal uh, payment. And I've got an interest rate on it at around 2%. I'm letting, and you let it run. I'll give you another quick example on this. I'll get people that in Canada, we cannot deduct the interest on our principal residence like we can with an investment unit. I'll get people that, you know, have got maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars left on their mortgage. They've owned it for 10 or 12 or 15 years, let's say. And they'll say, well, maybe I should start paying down. I want to start paying down lump sums on my mortgage, maybe 10,000 a year. Well, think that over. Unless you've got a four or five or six million dollar stock portfolio and own other multi multiple properties, you know, I think at least a net worth of five million or more. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense paying down a principal res residence mortgage if you're paying one six, one seven, one eight. Let's just call it anything under three percent interest, which you should be. You'd be better off taking that extra ten thousand dollars you wanted to use to pay down your mortgage, put that into an index fund, or let's just keep it simple here. I always use this as an example: buy some Bell Canada shares. Even though Bell Canada has had an incredible run here, it's up about 30 or 35% in the last year or so. But Bell Canada, as I speak right now, is still yielding about 5.6% dividend. Now, over the long term, Bell Canada's had a nice run here, but let's just be very conservative with this and say you get another 2 to 3% annualized rate of return or capital gain. And that's about what it does. It's, it's an orphans and widows stock, but I love it. I own a lot of Bell Canada, a lot of TELUS, a lot of Shaw, all the banks in my cash account. And I just collect those dividends. And they raise those dividends every year like clockwork. So Bell Canada yielding 5.5%, let's say you get another 2% annualized return over the next 10 years. Now you're talking 7.5%, 8%. Plus that dividend is tax favorable. You're going to get a dividend tax credit on that in Canada. So why would you pay off your mortgage at 2.5% when you can get 8% over here all day? That's leverage. Let the leverage run on that. You're in control there. You've got a lot of equity in your home. You're not over leveraging. Again, the Canadian banks won't let you do that. So that's the thinking you have to have. And guys, don't come at me with questions here on leverage and and that kind of thing. I, I'm giving you guys this as a catalyst. As I say, I'm not gonna, my book, buy my book, that's a good first start for you. Watch my other blogs that I've done on this, but I want you guys to learn this stuff. It's really easy. It's that, what I keep coming back to, that 100 hours. You gotta spend at least 100 hours on understanding how leverage works, borrowing money, interest rates, investing, index investing, how stocks and dividends work, the payout ratios on dividends, how they're taxed. You have to learn the basics of taxation for sure. The difference between cash accounts on registered, RSP and TFSA, because there's a lot of nuances in there. TFSA is great, it's all sheltered, but you don't get the write-off going in. Any U.S. companies that you're holding in a TFSA, you're going to have a, on a dividend, you're going to have a withholding tax that you cannot recoup. Better to have your growth names in a TFSA. You, you've got to get the handle on this, and it's easy. 100, 200 hours can mean millions of dollars, you know, for, for you know, the real successful people and their earning income, but it can mean at least hundred, several hundred thousand dollars to a guy making 60 or $70,000 a year over the next 25 years. Easily a couple hundred grand to learn this stuff as opposed to paying someone an outrageous fee to manage it for you and to learn this stuff for you. Google leverage, go on to Canadian Couch Potato. All kinds of books on the basics of this stuff that you guys need to learn, but it's all out there. People lump in debt like it's taboo. It depends on what kind of debt it is. If it's mortgage, mortgages on principal residence and, and investment units, hey, I'd be trying to take as much of that as you can. I'm getting ready to buy another property as I blogged about last month here. I got my approval here for another 750. I could do a lot more, but I just wanna buy a clean, simple one bed down on the West End here. 
put down 20% and borrow the other 80. And it's just to set it and forget it, or what I call in my book, the go ship to wealth. You put the 20% down, buy it, put a tenant in there, and just set it off to sea. I'm old Big Line. As always, hope everyone's having a good summer. Thanks for all my new subscribers. I'll see you next week.